This aerial photo showed what the main plant complex looked like in 1948, its 50th anniversary. That year, this roof sign was perched atop Building 32 and was visible from the Logan Street Bridge. In 1949, to compete with the newly introduced Cadillac Coupe de Ville, Oldsmobile introduced a hardtop convertible version of the 98 called the Holiday. Later in the year, Olds would introduce a newcomer, also equipped with the Rocket V8. Against a comparably equipped 98, the 88 weighed 200 to 300 pounds less and promptly made Olds the NASCAR champion that year and again in 1950 and 51. The same was true on the street, as nothing could touch the Rocket 88. Its performance on the NASCAR circuit was so impressive that it was selected as the pace car for the 1949 Indy 500, the first Olds so honored. A new assembly plant that joined Building 75 and 32 was completed on December 6, 1949. At one time, it achieved the highest line speed of any U.S. car assembly plant, ultimately turning out over 110 units per hour on the line. Further changes were soon needed to keep pace with the demand for the new Rocket Oldsmobiles. 1950 reached an all-time production high of over 400,000 cars. It also became a crossroads year in Olds history. On July 23rd, Oldsmobile Smokestack, a city landmark since 1919, came down along with most of the remaining original buildings to make way for capacity boosting changes. 34 days later would mark the passing of its founder, Ransom Eli Oles, at the age of 86. Gone were some of the major links to the original people, plants, and products. That same year, Building 37 went up in the spot where curved dashes were once built. It produced 90-millimeter gun tubes for the Korean War and would later become a northward expansion of the Building 56 press room. In 1951, Building 1B, built in 1901, and the last of the plant's historic structures, was raised along with the old powerhouse to extend Building 37. The new compressor room remains in its same location in Building 37 to this day. In July of 1951, Oldsmobile broke ground on a 700,000 square foot new plant to build jet engine parts. Buick received a contract to build Wright J-65 jet engines for the Korean conflict, and Oldsmobile was subcontracted to build the compressors and turbines. In May of 1952, General Douglas MacArthur visited the Lansing plants with GM President Charles Wilson. The jet plant would go on to become Plant 3, Oldsmobile's metal fabricating division. In 1955, Oldsmobile passed Plymouth for fourth in industry sales, its highest ranking since the curve dash days. In the mid-1950s, many dignitaries and celebrities visited the plant. Here, famous band leader Lawrence Welk poses with his fleet of 1952 Oldsmobiles. Vice President Richard Nixon and Jimmy Stewart came to town. Patty Page, Shirley Jones, and Jerry Lewis were among other notables. Page and Jones were once old spokespersons. In 1956, expansion was needed to keep up with the increasing demand for rocket engines. Buildings 39 and 23 were added to the engine plant. Building 39 was equipped with semi-automatic NATCO assembly lines for short block production, while Building 23 would house the new V8 block floor. In 1958, Oldsmobile celebrated its 60th anniversary in a special way. At the opening of the Mackinac Bridge, the first 83 cars to cross were brand new white Oldsmobile convertibles, one for each county queen on board. Beginning in the late 50s, Oldsmobile supplied a new car to the winner of the annual Miss America pageant. In 1959, an Oldsmobile, driven by Lee Petty, won the first Daytona 500 race. At the end of the 50s, car buyers were turning from big gas guzzlers toward economy models. In response to rising economy car sales, GM began building its own compacts. In 1960, Chevrolet introduced the rear-engine Corvair, and Olds would answer with the F85. Like the Corvair, it had frameless, unibody construction, which meant it couldn't be built on the same line as the big cars in Building 75 and 32. Building 16, 
which became a parts warehouse when car assembly was moved in 1950, was retooled for the smaller car line. That meant a new warehouse was needed. GM purchased 100 acres west of Waverly Road and began construction of Plant 4, which became the Service Parts Organization. Over half a mile long and more than 700,000 square feet, it would be the largest building in Olds history. Meanwhile, in Building 16 and 20, F-85 production commenced on June 9, 1960. A Cutlass Coupe edition was added in 1961, and the popular 442 package debuted in 1964. That year, the standard F-85 would grow to intermediate size with a longer wheelbase and frame. All of its models were then moved to the big car final assembly plant. This paved the way for another conversion to building 16 assembly lines, which would soon be announced. In September of 1960, ground was broken for building 66, the new engineering center. It would house conference rooms, offices, the experimental wood model shop, experimental garage, and the experimental heavy press room. On July 11, 1962, Oldsmobile celebrated the 20th anniversary of GM's suggestion plan by giving away this new F-85. In the summer of 1966, the new administration center, Building 70, opened. An exciting newcomer joined the O's lineup that year. The front-wheel drive luxury two-seat Tornado. It was built in Building 16 after a brand new line was installed since the departure of the F-85. Building 150 also went up in 1966 to house a new paint repair system. Situated west of Logan Street, its land had been purchased in 1951 when GM leveled the vacant Lansing Drop Forge to add parking space. In 1970, Building 22 went up at the east end of the plant. It would house a new cylinder headline and the remaining head floor from Building 23. This would free up space in Building 23 for an additional block line to keep up with expanding rocket V8 engine sales. In 1971, another landmark fell as the old water tower, built in 1919, came down. In 1972, Oldsmobile passed its rival Pontiac to take over the number three spot in industry sales. Olds also marked its 75th anniversary on August 21st with a Merry Olds Day celebration in front of the state capitol. On October 16, 1978, a dedication of the new Cutlass Assembly Center took place in Building 90. Building 150 paint repair is also shown on the map west of Logan Street. In 1979, Oldsmobile broke ground on a new diesel engine plant west of Lansing in Delta Township. During the energy crisis decade of the 70s, lower-priced diesel fuel was being eyed as a possible option. Unfortunately, after building a $500 million plant with a capacity to build 3,200 engines per day, the price of diesel fuel rose and eventually exceeded the price of gas. The demand for diesel engines plummeted, and GM ceased their production in 1985. Now known as Plant 5, it switched to the production of dual overhead cam 16-valve engines until its closing in 2001. 1984 was the last year Olds operated its own plants and became a marketing unit of BOC. Oldsmobile converted and began production of front-wheel drive N cars. The conversion was complete with the new name on the roof sign. Although it lost its Oldsmobile identity, Lansing's new capacity of 120 cars per hour would earn it the title of Car Capital of the World. In a consolidation of stamping for the GM20 models, presses from Building 56 were moved to Plant 3 in 1989. This would help make room for what would later become the underbody annex. On April 5, 1990, a sad day in Ohl's history occurred when the last rocket V8 engine was manufactured. Buick V6s would be built for a few more years until the famed Kettering engine plant was closed for good in July of 1993. After nearly 80 years of Ohl's built engines, the cavernous empty structures would sit idle for the next five years. As heartbreaking as it was for Lansing's workforce, there would be a silver lining on the horizon. In 1992, the BOC name was changed to Lansing Automotive Division. 
The name changed again to small car group Lansing Operations in 1996 and Lansing Car Assembly in 1998. The Olds logo changed again from the rocket to the smooth oval. In 1997, Oldsmobile celebrated its 100th anniversary. Every employee in the plant received a commemorative copy of the Oldsmobile history book setting the pace. In 1998, Lansing's original Plant One site would make its final conversion to build the next generation of Pontiac Grand Am, Olds Alero, and Chevy Malibu. Due to a space shortage, at Fisher Body, the center of the plant was retooled to build the underbodies. The area that had originally built curved dashes and World War II gun tubes was now called the Underbody Annex, since the rest of the plant had implemented quality network plan maintenance in 1996. The annex would be treated as a standalone plant and started QNPM in 1999. On April 29, 2004. Another sad day in Lansing history occurred as GM retired the Oldsmobile brand. The last Alero was built in the South Plant and sent to R.E. Oles Transportation Museum. After more than 50 years of car building, the South Plant would be idled the following June. Building 90, which became the North Plant in the BOC conversion of 1984, would still produce the Chevrolet Classic and the Grand Am through 2005. The decision to end Oldsmobile production had come from Detroit in 2000 and was no secret to plant personnel. Faced with an uncertain future, UAW members continued to deliver workmanship of remarkable quality. When it was idled, the South Plant was the leading assembly plant in the country, according to J.D. Power, and the North Plant was ranked in the top three. Both plants also ranked one and two in the annual Harbor Report for plant efficiency leading the way in processes like production maintenance partnership and team build participation also helped its members earn the QNPM Phase 3 award for best in class in both chassis and annex operations. To be acknowledged in so many categories even as the last car was being built in Building 32 is a tribute to the kind of labor force that exists in Lansing. Attention to detail and caring about quality are traits that are taken seriously. Employee involvement and awareness in programs like the Global Manufacturing System and Quality Network Plan Maintenance are tools that make it easier for a worker to transition to a new plant. Having a highly skilled workforce with a reputation for cooperative union management relations was undoubtedly a factor in GM's decision to build the Lansing Grand River Assembly Plant there. In 1998, after decommissioning the east end of the plant, Mostly vacant since the halt of engine production, construction commenced. After an unprecedented 1,600 hours of training for all LGR employees, the first Cadillac CTS was built in 2001. Not only was LGR the first new GM plant built in North America since Saturn, six months after production began, it became the first assembly plant to achieve QNPM Phase 3 certification. UAW Local 652 and 602 would gain two additional new facilities with the Lansing Regional Stamping Center and the Delta Township plant slated to begin production in 2006. After 107 years of car building, Lansing has been through the incredible highs and lows that are customary with not only the auto industry but with the economy and business in general. With its new plants, one thing does remain constant for this great car town. It will remain the world's oldest continuous producer of automobiles. It's a special feeling,